what I know is that there, uh, one of the papers that I have re uh, written, and you don't have the latest version of it, I have a version that I prefer that I will send you, that will be your reading for next week. So what happens is that I am here before you read the paper, but in a way it doesn't matter because I have had the chance to see your work. So um, I, I, would, I would like to just, uh, before I start blabbering, if any of you have questions that you would like us to continue to talk about after you have shown your projects, and uh, to just pursue some of the questions, we, we are just going to take like not more than five minutes to see some of the questions that you may like to just continue to talk about. If there is nothing sort of obvious, uh, I will just uh, tell a bit the story of, you know, uh, my, own, my own way of thinking and so on. But if, if there is some themes coming up, please, yeah? So, um, in terms of like conversion phenomenon, yeah. Um, like the, the computer models, you know, obviously offers a lot of um, insights, you know, in terms of like, of, you know, watching emergent behavior uh, come together. Yeah. In terms of um, using computer models as a learning tool for simpler phenomena, um, I wonder if you could speak to that at all. Okay. Okay. Let some mo more come up. Some more. Um, it, it's just going to drive a little bit what I want to talk about. Anything else that came out as puzzlement or... Yes? Yeah, so when, for example, you the example of William, William, white choices, um, you, you mentioned that um, children sometimes have a very good, like, they're trying to get with a boat or you know, all of the white yeah. so It's very unscientific. It's completely wrong in a sense, right? In terms of what we actually really have. Okay. So I was wondering. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very. How, how, at this, like, at certain age levels, whether you think there are possibilities to still sort of align the behavior that you see in children with the reality such a new condition or like tiny moment that they change and transform this knowledge. Okay. That's a good starting point because what I want to uh, convey is this notion that um, whether we like it or not, if I put on the hat of an educator, whether we like it or not, we have to start from the ways in which children make sense of the phenomenon that we want to teach if we want to get them to abandon their current views of the world. And I, I just want to give you a little uh, uh, lesson that I have learned in working with Jean Piaget, who was a developmental psychologist, and the paradox is that he said he was more interested in how people learn uh, why people think of, let's say, scientific phenomenon in certain ways, at certain phases in their development, and even how in the history of a certain discipline, how the thinking has been evolving. Uh, so he was always comparing, for example, how the, 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 ex the scientific explanation evolved within, among scientists, and also he called it ontogeny within uh, a, a child's life. And then there are uh, smaller genesis like microgenesis and so on. And the, what Piaget's theory shows very well is that inside the stages, the stages only give you a sort of a scope of people's interests and capabilities and ways of thinking at given levels of their development. So if, if a baby, and, and the big, big passages are age two, when a baby does something like a trial and error, even if what you observe is exactly the same than if you see a three-year-old do the trial and error, it is not the same even if it appears to be the same sequence of behaviors. Be 
because the cognitive abilities of a baby are slightly different from the one of a four-year-old. And the big pa first passage is to go from this sort of here and now way of um, apprehending the world to the beginning of the symbolic function. And the beginning of the symbolic function means that you can, in a way, uh, reconstruct what you have been doing in the, in the here and now across time and space, right? So you, you begin to be able to also understand that uh, something can stand as a, as a symbol for something else, but even more important, what you learn all of a sudden at age two is that an action that you have been done, doing before can become an object to think with. So a sig it's almost like in programming, you, you write a, a procedure instead of just doing step-by-step -step commands. So children can take their own activity as an object to think about their own activity, which gives huge potential. And then around six and seven, they begin to think more rationally and so forth and so on. I don't want to go into the stages, although it's useful to give you a scope. So for example, for the balance beam, uh, it is useful to, to, to get a sense of children of what age do you have, and to get to take a lot of time to try to understand and also honor in a, in the way the way they make sense of the situation, because you have to start from there to shovel in your view of, uh, as experts. You cannot just start from the point of view of the expert and then water it down for those who have not yet understood to get to understand. You will not succeed. Because people have to connect what you are trying to teach them to their own experience and what they had made of their experience, they will always bring it back to that. So it's not a good idea in general, and there is a lot of literature about that, to think about the novice expert model in the dichotomous way in which much of computational tradition, even in in, in, in thinking about learning as information processing and so on. This, this dichotomy between the novices get it wrong, the experts have it right, you know. Uh, we are going to model way, ways in which the expert sees and then we water it down for them to understand. It doesn't work. And actually we have seen some of this, we see some of this even in the FabLearn co conference when, when an engineer uh, tries to explain to non-engineers, you know, how to, m to make an Arduino board work. If the person has no sense of, even give you a little sense of why, if you have to do all these random acts, why this, this, this is going to be of benefit to anything at some point, you don't go far, far away. What Piaget has so shown so well is that people, he defines intelligence as adaptation, and, as, and adaptation as a balance between actually being able to impose one's order on things. You always look at the unknown as a kind of something that is already familiar. This is our ways, no matter what age we are, to actually uh, get a handle or try to understand things that we don't understand yet. It's called assimilation in this theory, but uh, you can call it different names. It's imposing one's order, is, is to look at the unknown in the terms of the familiar. It's just getting at something new in terms of what you already know. And sometimes the kinds of things you already know are even of a heuristic kind, like it goes meta, because we are not just learners about phenomenon, we are learners about, I know myself, <laughs> I know what works for me. You are learners about learners. So sometimes if you don't know how to go about a situation, you actually start at the opposite end. Instead of imposing one order, to, you, you start by saying, I'm just going to meddle around with the situation. We call it, you let the object talk. Because in a way, you know that if you just start messing around with some materials, the ideas will come, and the more you do it, and, you, the, the, and then the, the ideas will eventually 
progress. So it's this paradox, you know, if you want to get ahead, get the theory, but if you want to get the theory, get ahead, get, 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 get muddling. And what Piaget showed so well is that it would be an adaptive catastrophe if any organism, an intelligent organism, would change their worldview, their belief systems is the best possible ways that the organism has been handling the complexities of the world in which it's living given its own maturational level. It would be a total catastrophe for an organism to change its worldview, not, not for its way of thinking about it, not to be sticky, just because you receive a surface perturbation from the point of view of the organism by somebody else. Be that perturbation the expert view of the world. It would be a catastrophe if an organism would too quickly accommodate constantly to what it hears from its environment. And this is why organisms don't do it. Whether you like it or not as a teacher, they don't do it. You, 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 can't, you can't do it. Because it's like in psychotherapy. You, 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 if somebody gives you an answer, you are going to take this in, the right answer, let's say, to a problem, and then it's get worked in, worked out in ways that are not visible from outside by the organism, and it brings you back in a certain field where it's compatible with what you already know. It's exactly like in psychotherapy. If, if, uh, if people have had a bad experience, now I caricature completely, if you have a, had a bad experience, let's say with your family or your father, you will, you will generalize it by uh, imposing what you try to solve with your husband or your, or your boyfriends, you know. Um, you, you, in a way, you, you cannot not do that. And if somebody tells you, you shouldn't do that, this is, this is an overgeneralization, you know, this is the way to do it, it won't help. Because we are, we are embedded, we, are, we, are, we, we, we become the fabric of the kind of knowledge that has allowed us to live for, 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 for a certain amount of time in certain types of situations. Now, if you apply this to the cognitive uh, level, it's the same. And in the kinds of problems that you are interested in, it has to do, and, the, and that's where the Piaget theory comes in well, it has to do with trying to understand how they understand the phenomenon and how you can offer prompts, uh, facilitations, uh, an environment like, and, and how you can use the technologies to allow them to explore this phenomenon from their point of view by also having the point of view of something else or somebody else, so it can be the right answer by the teacher. It can also be the other ways in which other people of different ages or the same look at the phenomenon. It can be the way in which certain tools uh, let you see, because what you want to do is to shake the belief system. That you want to do, to shake the belief system but in order to get shaken in a way that will prevail, that, that will not just disturb or be rejected by the sort of stickiness of the way we think, um, there needs to be more than one opportunity to engage the phenomena. Marvin Minsky says it in a way that I like. He says, a phenomenon that I, I don't quite know only has a meaning if it has at least three. So or, only if you have at least three different ways of four or five different ways of looking at something that, that is unfamiliar, you begin to put in question your own ways of thinking. And then it's a lengthy process, you know, for people to actually reach the, the kind of understandings that you would like. So one hopes, and it's the case, that educational institution, in a way, they know more or less what's the, the boundaries, what's the scope, right? They are not going to try to teach something crazy, uh, 
to people, to very little people, for example, uh, the very, very complicated algebra or, or physics or so, or so on. But still, um, there are very big differences in the way in which people try to um, arrange, orchestrate the environments for exploration and also, and also instruction so that people can actually move away from, from their own position. So that's one of the things that I learned from Piaget. What I learned from, from Seymour Papert is that uh, in order, if you want people to build, even if you are interested in having people thinking more, let's say, logically or rationally or, or more abstractly, the way to go about it is to remember that the genesis of abstract thinking is that we are grounded in our bodies, that uh, without our hands our minds doesn't work very well, and without tools the hands and the mind don't work optimally. And uh, in a way, if you are really seriously considering the notion that there is a genesis to come even to abstract or, or expert way of thinking, you shouldn't at all find it uh, regressive to ground in people's even sensory motor knowledge the first types of explorations. And this is the whole adventure of Simon Papert. You can talk about this later. He offered to, to, to young people an approach to geometry that was not just analytical, that was not just about thinking about figures in space once they have already built. It's not just about applying the formulas, which was a way of expressing what experts see in the dynamic of complex phenomena. It's not just about that. It's about offering an entrance that allows you to use even your sensory motor and concrete understanding of a phenomenon in order to reach let's say, the capacity to infer the commonalities or not between different types of instantiation of the same phenomenon. So, uh, what, what Seymour Papert did is he said to himself, what is it that you tell somebody or not tell to somebody if you want them to discover it, not just by themselves, with the help of others, but it prevails, it remains. And his hypothesis was that it was a good idea to add to the usual ways in which we learn about geometry. Another entry point where you tap into your own tacit knowledge about your own movements in space, and you offer a way of mediating that progressively, but not mediating as in becoming abstract, in such a way that you begin to have another way of going about geometry. So, the example uh, is, I, I do give the example of, of turtle geometry uh, in Logo, but it doesn't matter, it can be another programming language, it can be other things. What the child has to do is to think about the ways in which geometrical figures have been built and what tools have been used to build it. It's different to think of a circle when you think of a circle as a point equidistant from a center that has been produced like by a, a compass, a compass? No, how do you call it? Um, a, a, a compass, or if you think of a circle as a certain kind of curvature in a differential way, like certain amount of going forwards and turns. And the idea is that if you want to understand circleness in a rich way, you need to multiply these different ways of thinking about circleness before you can abstract the notion of circleness. The same goes with number. Um, so what he did is that he developed a whole geometry that is based more on, instead of, he said, normally in geometry you give, the given is the orthogonal system, and then you have tools and you, you, you help people plot uh, objects, you know, and to define their position and movement according to the orthogonal system. 
he reversed that. He never talks about this in these terms, but he reversed it. He says, what I am not going to give is the orthogonal system. I start from a system that is voluntarily egocentric, which is an avatar of my own way of moving in space and in actually describing the way I move in space and to make it explicit by giving instructions to a robot that is an avatar of myself of how it is going to build to construct these uh, uh, geometric uh, um, shapes or you know uh, uh, geometric orders it gives you a completely different way of abstracting from your own sensory motor experience so the idea is it starts at the sensory motor level you give this instruction, you build these different figures. And the way of me is to find a way to talk to the extension of yourself in, in using words. So you have to make, in a way, your, your, your intuition more explicit, but it can still remain very concrete. The idea is very counterintuitive. It's stay concrete as long as you can and allow this of mediating. So I want to give an example of this. Uh, it's work by Ricardo Nomirovsky, who is now in California. He worked at, at Tur the Education Research Center in Boston. And we worked together for the longest time about what he calls the mathematics of variation. So it's the rule of you know, you can't understand why children sometimes find the graphs of statistics, like your virtual graphs, more complicated. They are meant to, to allow you to understand variations in phenomena, find them more complicated than the, the phenomenon itself. And he was interested in simple uh, relationship between time, distance, and speed. So what they did to introduce young children to graphs of, uh, you know, uh, distance, uh, vitesse, uh, time, they started at the sensory motor level. So they have a motion detector, and the child has a sensor on the body, and the child moves in front of the motion detector, and what the motion detector detects is the distance of this button according to it. And it writes it down, as it plots it as a value on a graph that is in the process of being constructed. So you can imagine, it's pure sensory motor. I go, I go like this, I see, well, it goes up, you know, I go back, well, it goes down. I accelerate, woo, the slope is much, uh, much higher. I go back, well, the slope is much more steep. So the mathematician looks at you and says, this has nothing to do with math. <laughs> this is pure sensory motor. On the other hand, to be able to control the graph by your movement and to begin, the children go, and I am talking not about tiny children, I'm talking about 12, 13, 13 year olds. They go on the graph and they, and they begin to say, each time when I go fast, it goes blah, blah, blah. Each time when I go uh, backwards, it goes blah, blah, blah. When I go, so these are little theorems. They are still wrong. And in SS, I used to call them phenomenological primitives. They are psychological units that you start working with. And you begin to understand the phenomenon in that. Now, imagine a way of mediating that, because you are not satisfied with that. Between that and becoming mathematics, there is a huge gap. So what we did at the time, and we were not, we did many studies with the children and the, and the motion detector. So then we had two people with a, one like this and one like this, and we try to create some uh, forms. So for example, children learn that the stupid graph never go backwards, you know? And, the, and so then they begin to understand what's the difference between this representation and the other. Because this one is showing time, right? And time always moves ahead, so just that is huge. And then, then they had two people with a motion detector, but then it became more interesting. They said to yourself, put the body out. This is sensory motor. So it's egocentric, it's good for a while, but you have to move away. So what they did is that they built um, a, a train, like a little train, 
and they put the sensor at the nose of the locomotive, of the train, and they started removing it from the body by first having a knob that you turn. So it's still analogic in an interesting way. You feel in your hand how much uh, you are going to push it forward and how fast. It's not yet like digital. So you are removed one step. You, you, you control this locomotive and you see what it's doing. It's slightly different from being a real body. And then you can just imagine that you replace this knob by, let's say, a digital knob. So you don't have the help of the, the, I have a field for the speed or a field for the distance. So you take away that field. I don't say it's better, huh, but if you want that, that's, a, that's, that's the way of doing it. Then you replace it by a digital, eventually, knob. And then what you can do is just imagine that you program this train to actually move back and forth. So this is just one example of how you actually get people from this sort of sensory motor feel for the, the rapport between you know, distance and, and learn to read graphs by mediating progressively, but the mediation doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go abstract immediately. Um, there, are, there are many examples in children's construction of number that I find interesting, or in, me in measurement. There is a beautiful book about how they teach children to measure from Reggio Emilia. This is a book that you need to buy for here. It's in Italian and English, and it's called Shoes and Meters. And it explains how the teachers over a certain period of time get the children to progress immensely on the measurement of things. Because measurement is a certain kind of quantification, but it's very different than, than only numbers, right? Measurement is more infralogic, number is more discrete, and so forth and so on. So they knew about the genesis of how children think about measurements, what they are able to do at certain ages, um, you know, including actually using their cell phones to, to be, you know, it doesn't matter. <laughs> the, the, the input comes from all over. But, but they start, they, they have a whole uh, way of getting the children to think about measurement in very different ways. So they start, they have to, to give to a, um, to the, the, the story goes they have to give to a carpenter the dimension of a table so that the carpenter can do it for them. And they are really, these are really guys, four to five year olds. Um, and, and it's very clear, it's authentic because the teacher says, I know that we could do this very fast to give him, but we are going to have fun out of this. You are going to give the instructions to the, to the carpenter. And the kids just start and they, do, they use uh, you know, stream and then and they graph and so on and so forth. At the end of the day, they found out very well that if they give a bundle of strings to this carpenter, each one color coded, you know, this is like the side of the table, he should be able to do it. But because it was a, it was actually a, a teaching situation and not just, you know, they tried to get them to color. So they, they went through all these different exercises where they also uh, jumped and, and, and measured how far children jumped and the children invented almost but in very quick, uh, quick uh, time, uh, time how do you say fast time they invented measuring tools so they started with a shoe this was silly because then they realized oh Nicolas shoes is not the same as my shoe but it started with the shoe but when you think of it you know we use feet and so on and 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 um, and then they, they, they use the way of measuring that they do, where you, you have not yet figured out what the measuring unit is, but you can measure very well if you, if you, if you just compare two things, you know. It's shorter than, than another one that they can do and so forth. So this is, this is another example. So I don't mean to say that you have to reinvent the entire history of how numbers have been actually uh, invented, it is an invention, it's not a discovery, it's not something that exists in the world, 
but you have to give the children a chance to tap into their own very concrete and sensory motor ways of thinking, let's say in the case of number about numerosity, in the case of balance also about, they, they have their own insights about equilibrium, because they have a body that is symmetrical, so they have, you, you know, you, you can tap into all that. So this is a very long way and, and, and lengthy way to, to just say that when you build these tools that are supposed to help them understand the phenomenon, the first thing to understand is that most of the misunderstanding in school comes from the fact that the children don't understand what the graph is. They don't know how to read the graph. They don't, they, don't, they don't have a nice sense of the phenomenon that the graph is capturing. Um, you know, when, when, when you model something, or when you give a formula, when you give a formula, it's terrible. You know, in, in, in the case of your, of your, um, roller coaster. of your roller coaster, it's like, even, I, I don't, we don't know what you're talking about. Basically, that's, that's how bad it is. We don't know what you're talking about, you know. Uh, so, of course, there are ways to introducing it, but um, you have to be generous enough to give a chance to the learner to at least ask them how they read what, whatever you offer to them, to learn to do a little bit of this clinical, very quick and dirty little interviewing, you know, and give them to help them shake their own beliefs. And I think people, especially little people, are very happy to do that. You see, they are not going to take in a counter suggestion to shake their, uh, their, their whole belief systems, but they're always open up to surprises. And, uh, they are, in that sense, they're much more innovative than, than, than older people. They are, they, are, they, are, they, are, they are always willing to, to go, to, to, to take the right when something is counterintuitive or surprising, which makes men say, oh, we don't think rationally because it's more like, oh, this is not the result I expected. How interesting I take the right instead of debugging and, you know. So, I don't know. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> but Paolo, Paolo, I really would like, I would like actually to have more of a conversation here because I, I am very, we were talking about this before, I, I like very much what you are trying to do here. And I would like you to give him a, 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 a real, um, your, your thoughts about how you came to doing this class. Because we have some similar paths in, in Papert's group, which was all about how to use technologies to offer environments for people to learn in a Piaget-ish way. And with a correction on Piaget-ish way, it's like we put Piaget on the head. Piaget was, Papert always says, Piaget was so obsessed with abstract thinking and the child as a, as a scientist that he was annoying. But he was so stubborn about his idea of understanding the genesis of what, how you get there. Papert says that his contribution to the world has been an amazing observatory of concrete thinking and the sensory motor grounding of human rational mind. And then he forgot, because then when he, when he studied older people, it became worse and worse. When he studied babies, it was brilliant. He had it all. The beginning of the symbolic function, he had it a lot because he already thought that it's not just about language acquisition, as all the scientists at the time were saying, you know. All the white guy dead already. Mm -hmm. Only language is the beginning of symbolic function because that's the, that's the noble one. He talked about pretense play, the importance of of imaginary companions, he talked about the importance of, uh, of um, more iconic types of representations and, and, and so on and so forth. 
But then he, he was so obsessed by the child as a scientist that he didn't study what the genesis of, let's say, pretense play would be if from a two-year-old you become excellent in your field as an adult. You would become a fabulous fiction writer or you would become a fabulous theater person, right? Because theater is all about, about uh, restituting let's say, original events in this parenthesis in which you can actually act out, sing and perform. He didn't study what, because um, he was too obsessed with, with scientific uh, thinking. But this is enough for your class, because you are actually interested in offering tools for having children think about science-related phenomenon in not just in formal, but in school in school or uh, in, in actually formal education. So um, I think the most important message here is just take very seriously this notion of the genesis of how this idea of the get born and allow not to go too quickly to the, the rational or to the you know in the same way that I, I like this definition of intelligence that says Hold as long as you can opposite ideas instead of giving a solution to the past. It's, it, it's very hard to hold it because we, especially, you know, you guys, you, you know the answer to most of these questions. You you probably are, are, are good at building these streets and so on. So it's, it's, it's sort of voluntary act of slowing down almost in your own mind and just remember, remember how you learn this thing. It's very difficult. Because it's also an ad it's very adaptive, and actually the people I work with study that. It's very adaptive to forget one's own psychogenesis. It would be annoying <laughs> to remember all the difficulties that we had, you know, when we were trying to master some of these difficulties that we have to understand. So once, once you understand it, you want to give the gift too quickly. To, to, to people who come behind them, it doesn't work that way. So I don't know what you can do to... Um, I think it, it would be nice for each of your son, even if you see just two kids of whatever age you want to target, you know, uh, do these little uh, explorations just in parallel, I would say, and um, and let it just inform you the, the process. You know. And there is also a lot of literature. The good thing is about most of the phenomena, except for the blood one that is sort of outside, it's very much in the range of kinds of things that children need to learn in school. And that is good. They, they, you know, it's about physical phenomena, it's about waves. It's about the kinds of things that you find at the exploratorium. Yes? Interview assignment for next week, right? So they have an assignment where they're actually supposed to be interviewing someone? Um, supposed to be, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it when in classes. <laughs> okay. So, what types of things should they be asking? Quick and dirty. So, um, <laughs> don't do, don't try to do assessment or so conversation. Co conversation. Um, prob probably, in, probably in the case of each of what you have been doing, just try to get, first of all, one of your friends, it doesn't even have to be a child, one of your friends to explore this and tell you how they understand the relation between almost like a kid, but somebody who is not in the know of this class, and and maybe just have a few children, I don't know, uh, to have a few children try to uh, make sense of what you offer, but then maybe also imagine I, I cannot not think of the pleasure experiment. I cannot uh, not think of it. But for the balancing, there are all these wonderful studies about 
how kids think about it. So you may not even have to do it for you. You can just read the paper. Um, there is a whole literature in the language thing. At now they because Sylvia, for example, did lots of studies, so she started all this with the formula. Uh, Andy de Sessa did work on this. He did a lot of work on physics. But he has also a very um, novice expert. But still, it's, um, these are things that we can do.